Welcome everybody, I am Seven and I am the DM of 7th Roll and today I am back with another 5th edition revision video. Today, as you can see on screen, we are going to be talking about the Paladin class. Um, for people who don't really know what this series is about, in very simple terms, uh, this is me not being 100% happy with the current state of 1D&D &D and where Wizards is taking Dungeons and Dragons. And at a certain point in time, I had been complaining about it too much, and I decided, you know what, instead of complaining about it, why don't I just make my own? And that's pretty much what these videos are. Uh, in case you haven't seen the previous ones currently, uh, we have done uh, Fighter, Monk, Barbarian, and... Which one am I forgetting? Ranger. So we've had four classes that we've already taken a look at, and today we're going to be talking about paladin the holy warrior now before we get into that um again i'm going to repeat uh the big points that i always repeat before this video or before these videos uh, which is a uh you have to remember that these are untested untried unbalanced this is just me taking ideas and throwing them on a piece of paper putting them in gm binder and pretty much just typing out what direction I would take these classes, whether or not that's good or bad. That's something that we can always test out later. Currently, these are just ideas. Um, second of all, this is based off of the original player's uh, handbook, the original 5th edition handbook. So although I do take inspiration from some of the 1 D&D changes because I'm not saying everything in 1 D&D is bad. Um, I do tend to start from the basics. And the reason that I tend to mention this is because I don't employ stuff like weapon mastery. Weapon mastery is not in this. So don't assume that like all of the changes from, from the glossary or stuff like that have come through here already. Um, the only change that I've really ever taken from 1D and put into my own revisions has been the exhaustion change that they did at some points, which they then also dropped again. Um, so that's really the basics that I want to talk about. So let's talk a little bit about Paladin. Um, a lot of people saw Paladin as in the original 5th edition as sort of the halfway between cleric and fighter, right? You had the combative abilities of the fighter, and then you had the holy and divine magic of the cleric. And because of that, Paladin was one of the two, let's not count Artificer for a second, was one of the two original um, half-casters. Now, for people who've seen the Ranger video, you already know that in that instance, I decided to step away from half-casters. But with Ranger, that idea was maybe a little weird, right? Because technically, I think Ranger can kind of work with it. With Paladin, however, there were a couple of things that I wanted to get to. And one of that is Paladin has had a relatively big problem with the idea of spell slots. Pretty much, um, and this is something that you see in the different 1 D&D versions that we've had of Paladin, the problem that Paladin has is because it uses spell slots, it also has features that rely on those spell slots. And the core feature of Paladin, namely the Divine Smite, is very heavily focused on that idea of spell slots. Now, why is this important? Because this led to multi-classes that were very problematic. And the best example of that is, of course, what I call one of the most broken, if not the bro most broken build in 5th edition, Sorcedon. Uh, pretty much, for those of you who don't know how that build works, you multi-class Paladin with Sorcerer. And because of the way spell slots work for multi-classed classes, you would actually get full spell slot levels. Pretty much you could play a paladin or you could play a paladin with spell slots as if it was a full caster. 
which gave you access to fifth level spell slots a lot earlier, right? Which meant you could get 68 Divine Smites as early as level, I want to say at level 11. And that's not even counting stuff like Warlock, where pretty much you can get, I don't know, nine levels of Warlock, two levels of Paladin, and now you Divine Smite with your Warlock slot, and you short rest, and you just get it back, right? The original balancing of Paladin that kind of went on never really took multi-classing into account, and because of its very heavy burst damage, that became problematic because you just amplified it. However, in my own design, one of the things that I wanted to try is I kind of wanted to try to keep that core idea of Paladin. I still wanted Paladin to feel like a Divine Warrior that could smite its foes. I wanted to keep that. And I didn't just want to nerf Divine Smite the same way that 1D&D did. I agree with the nerfs. I do want to mention this. Like, if Wizards nerfs Divine Smite in the original way, I actually kind of agree with it, right? Like, this idea of you can only use one Divine Smite per turn. I don't like the... I think that was Bundle 6 change to Divine Smite, where Divine Smite pretty much just became, here, have a bunch of spells on the house. I don't like that change. So I agree with those changes, but I still want to try to make Paladin Smite an interesting feature for Paladin and maybe put it together with some other stuff. And hopefully you can still have that burst damage, but just you can't amplify it as easily with multiclassing. Um, because I don't know how much of a problem Paladin really is without multiclassing. I've actually, ironically enough, I personally played a Paladin at some point and I wasn't really a fan of pure Paladin. Um, but maybe that's just me. Anyway, let's get into this stuff. So, um, this is the table. You can already see that I'm really using my, uh, patented final table this is something that, that pretty much every single class is going to have up until we get to casters i guess um you can see the features here again i'm not 100 percent sure if all of this is correct because sometimes i fuck this up um also again for class features this has not changed whatsoever um i'm not in a position where i'm going to change this stuff yet um at least not on, on this class. So this is all, unless I screwed something up, this has all stayed the same. But then, let's get to the features, let's get to the stuff that we want to talk about. Divine Combatant. Um, I'm going to try to explain this in two different ways, I'm going to read through it in a second, but in case there are people who have seen the fighter video, or who know how Battlemaster works, pretty much... In very short terms, what I've done is I've given Paladin superiority dice. However, there's two big differences. One, these divine dice, as they're called, right, only refresh on a long rest. And if I'm not mistaken, you cannot use multiple superiority dice in one go. Divine dice, however, you can use multiple in one go. Uh, there are certain features, we're going to talk about the powers in a minute. Uh, there are certain powers that allow you to power up the power by using more dice. However, there's a limit to how powerful you can make it. That is in short how it works. So, let's look through it quickly. Divine Combatants, uh, you learn a number of powers of your choice when you take your first level in this class, gain additional powers as you level up. Your amount of known powers is determined by the power column in the class table. Every time you get a Paladin level, replace one power you know by a different one that you can take. I also think I have to switch these two places, to be perfectly honest, but anyway. Then, Divine Dice. You have a maximum number of Divine Dice equal to your Paladin level, the size of which starts at a d6 and upgrades at higher levels. The die size is determined by the class table. This is this table. You might notice that this is the same dice table that I've used for Fighter and Monk, in case you're wondering. Um... A Divine Dice is expended when you use it, and you regain all of your expended dice when you finish a long rest. So that is the first big difference with superiority dice. Powered up, several abilities allow you to spend additional Divine Dice to upgrade the power or even to spend Divine Dice to combine some powers. We'll talk about that in a second. 
You can only spend a number of divine dice equal to your proficiency bonus on one instance of using a or multiple powers. So what that means is, um, some of you probably have already guessed this, but for example, divine smite, right? If you spend one divine die, you can divine smite on an attack for 2d8 points of radiant damage. However, at level 2, you have two divine dice. And your proficiency bonus is plus 2. So at this point, if you choose, you can make one attack and you can spend two divine dice on that attack to deal 3d8 points of radiant damage. However, once you hit level 3, you will have a maximum of three divine dice, but your proficiency bonus is still only plus two. So you can still only spend two divine dice to divine smite for 3d8 damage, and this only changes once you hit level five, because then your proficiency bonus becomes plus three. That's how it works. Saving throws. Some of the powers, of course, require your target to make a saving throw to resist the power's effects. Saving throw DC is calculated as eight plus your proficiency bonus plus your charisma modifier, as per usual. Um, and I think that is pretty much the way that Divine Combatant works. So it works very similarly to Superiority Die in Fighter, or originally in the original 5th edition in Battlemaster, but it's a long rest version of it. So before we continue with the features, I figured let's have a look at some of these powers. You're gonna recognize some of these, specifically you're going to recognize the smites. You have Divine Smite as your basic Divine Smite. Whenever you hit an enemy with an attack, roll your Divine dice twi die, die twice, my god, and deal radiant damage to the target of the attack equal to combined results. And you can spend additional Divine dice whenever you use this Divine Power, dealing additional radiant damage equal to one roll of the die. However, um, there's a couple of things that I want to talk about here. So first of all, all of the original smite spells are in here in some way, shape, or form. Every single smite spell that I've found is in here. Banishing smite is the fifth level spell uh, smite. However, each of them, uh, each of the ones that are not divine smites, deal one roll of your divine die. However, they get an additional little ability. So for example, Banishing Smite, in addition, if this attack reduces the target to 50 hit points or fewer, you banish it. However, every single Smite, except for Divine Smite, and there's another one, Necrotic Smite, which I'll get to in a second, also has an additional part to the feature. Namely, if you are using a Divine Power with Smite in its name already, you can add this power to that by paying the cost. However, you do not deal the damage of this power. So, let me explain what that means. Let's say that you Divine Smite someone, and let's say that you are level 5, right? So you can spend 3 Divine Dice on one attack. Let's say that you Divine Smite, and you just take the normal Divine Smites, right? One point. But you realize, you know what, maybe I want to put some stuff in there. So what you do is, you go, okay, I'm going to Divine Smite to deal radiant damage because for example you're playing against a creature who uh let me look here who is within a silence so you can't deal thunder damage to it but you still want to use thunder smite you still want to knock the target prone because you want to have a second attack and get advantage on it maybe so you can actually divine smite but add the thunderous smite feature on top of it by spending one additional divine die its cost however if you do that you do not deal the damage of this power so in this case what you would do is you would spend two divine die you would deal 2d8 uh, or 2d yeah i think at level five it's 2d8 so 2d8 radiant damage and the target would then have to make a strength saving throw or be pushed 10 feet away and knocked prone Interestingly, if you have several smites, that means you can Divine Smite and Thunderous Smite and, for example, Branding Smite. And you can push everything into one thing. You can also take the damage from Thunderous Smite and combine it with Blinding Smite's additional features. Stuff like that. You can combine your smites. 
which that was something that I personally really like the idea of. Pretty much you can just throw a couple of smites together. You're not going to get an increase in damage, but you can get multiple pieces of utility. And I think that's kind of a fun one. And then finally, what I also want to talk about is necrotic smites. Um, if you are an Oathbreaker, for example, you now deal necrotic damage instead of radiant damage, for example. Um, so, again, do remember these are powers, so you do have to choose a limited amount of powers, and then you can use those throughout the day. Um, so you do have to pick which smites you want to have. Some of them have level requirements, and some of them have subclass requirements. All right. However, there's some other stuff in here too, and one of the more uh, famous ones is, of course, going to be Lay on Hands. Lay on Hands is no longer a pool for the Paladin. I don't know if this is a good idea. There's a very good chance that I'm going to put Lay on Hands back to a pool. Uh, the reason that I'm saying this is because the one thing I'm slightly afraid of is that Paladins are just never going to heal anymore. However, that's kind of the thing that I wanted to go for, was like allowing paladins to have more utility, to go for like a more utility-based build, right? That's the thing that I've been trying to do with most of these class reworks, is I want to have classes to have different build options. And so Lay on Hands, to me, just made sense as sort of a divine power that you could use, that you could use energy for. For me, it never really made sense that you had a pool for Lay on Hands and a pool for Divine Smites, and they never really came together. Um, so I did that. I did, however, uh, one thing that I want to mention, I did, however, say whenever you use Lay on Hands, you roll your Divine, tw your divine Die twice and heal your target with that number. You start off with D6s at level 1, which means you would heal them 2D6, which on average is 7, so technically it's more. And in addition, for every additional Divine Dies that you spend, you get to roll two additional uh, rolls. So, for example, if you spend two Divine Dice on Lay on Hands, you would roll, uh, let's say at level 3 or something, you would roll 4d6s. And then at level 5, it becomes 4d8. Um, the reason for this is twofold. One, in one of the last 1D&Ds, they actually buffed healing, like Cure Wounds now heals 2D8s instead of 1D8 per level. Uh, and I do agree with that. I do think that this is a good thing. And it also puts Lay on Hands on, I think, a little bit of a higher pedestal. So I am a, a fan of just making Lay on Hands something like this, uh, personally. So, yeah, that's really one that I want to talk about. Then let's go through the rest. Blessed Fighter. As an action, you can blast any target that you can touch. For the next hour, that target adds a roll of your Divine Die to all their attack rolls and saving throws. Pretty, pretty much, you know, bless, uh, the spell bless, but with your Divine Dice instead of the actual spell, uh, but only to one target and without concentration. Uh, we've already talked about the smites. Defensive barrier. Um, you can give someone a number of temporary hit points equal to a roll of your Divine Dice. And you can give them additional uh, temporary hit points. Grand Aura. At level 6, you get Aura of Protection. That has not changed. However, if you want, you can roll a Divine Die to increase your size of the Aura of Protection by a number of feet. A little bit more utility. Not everybody doesn't have to be as close anymore. It might be good against things like Fireball. I'm actually thinking of maybe even making this for the next minutes. Uh, because I think this could be a cool feature to just be like a little bit more protective. Uh, it is a bonus action to you, so you can still attack, but it just gives you that additional protection because 10 feet is a very close distance. And I think this is a little, like, this is fun. Holy Protection, whenever an enemy hits you with an attack, uh, you can roll a Divine Die as a reaction at the number roll to your AC until the start of your next turn. Pretty much a sort of shield. Uh, make you more of a tank character, right? I kind of want Paladins to be able to choose between support damage dealer or tank pretty much whatever direction you want to go in proficient blessing this is just a fun one i thought as an action bless any target you can touch choose a skill proficiency if they make a roll with that uh, they get to add their divine die to the skill check with that proficiency uh, it doesn't make them proficient in the check by the way it just gives them the uh just gives them a sort of guidance uh for uh until um the next dawn uh, but they can only be blessed like this once. Every target can only be blessed once like this. 
pretty much a little bit of utility. Um, Searing Smite, Staggering Smite, Thunder Smite, Vengeful Targets. This is one for the Oath of Vengeance. So, as a bonus action, you can make an enemy the target of your fury. You spend a Divine Die. Whenever any creature attacks the target, they may add that Divine Die to their attack roll. Uh, pretty much a little bit of an extrapolation of um, the, the Oath of Vengeance feature, the level 3, their, their ability, what's it called? Uh, the one where they specific where they get advantage on a target for a minute. Um, I don't remember it off the top of my head. It's in the document. It, Vow of enmity. That's it. Um, a little bit of an extrapolation of that, and then wrathful smite. We've talked about. So those are the powers. Those are the current list of powers. Again, I do want to add more, but this is sort of just to show the big ideas behind divine powers and why they only refresh on a long rests because they are i feel slightly more powerful than what a uh, fighter gets all right so let's continue with the actual features then so at level one i also added a little bit of utility with divine knowledge um choose one proficiency from the paladin skill list your deity has given you knowledge and strength through holy means whenever you roll that skill proficiency you can use charisma instead of the normal attribute used for this skill check um you can change this proficiency so originally it has to be from the paladin skill list at level nine it can be from any skill proficiency um one of the things that i've noticed is i've really kind of skimped on skill proficiency features in some classes and i do want to work on that a little bit i do want to give classes a little bit of utility outside of combat and for Paladin, I had a spot open, seeing as um, Lay on Hands was moved into the powers, so I figured Divine Knowledge might be a fun one. Channel Divinity has now come to level 2. Um, I never really understood why it had to be level 3. Uh, remember, this used to have Divine Smite, which also has moved to the powers, so no longer a thing. Um... Pretty much you get Channel Divinity, you know, still recharges on a short rest. You only get one because you're a Paladin. Uh, and you now get a specific Channel Divinity, no matter what subclass you are, namely Divine Recharge. You regain a number of Divine Dice equal to your Charisma modifier, up to your maximum number of Divine Dice, giving you the possibility to get back some Divine Dice. Um, so that, you know, at level 2, for example, one of the things that you know, I was worried about was like at level two, you divine smite once and you're done. Uh, I don't necessarily want that to happen. Um, so I figured, you know what, let's, let's give you a little bit of usage with divine recharge, stuff like that. Give you a little bit of uh, wiggle room, so to speak. Fighting style, this is still the exact same. Archery, defense, dueling, and two weapon fighting. Uh, so hasn't really changed. Sacred Oath. Um, I want to talk about this for a second uh, because there's a couple of things. First of all, uh, still at level 3. However, the ones that are currently noted here are Oath of Vengeance and Oath Breaker. Now, you might be thinking, wait, in every single other class video that you've made, you have talked about three different subclasses. You're right. Usually I try to make three. I do, however, have a reason. The problem is I cannot, well, I could, but I, I don't want to talk about it just yet. There is a change that I'm planning in one of my future videos that is going to affect some subclasses. And because of that, I kind of want to wait until that moment to talk about these subclasses. Um, so why is Oathbreaker here? Because I like Oathbreaker and I had the Necrotic Smite idea, so I just put it here. And I'm also probably at least going to put one more Oath in, uh, into the game. Uh, probably even two, possibly even two. Um, the thing is, I personally feel like Oathbreaker should be in the base book. I'm going to be honest. And the reason for that is very simple. Um, they have this entire talk in the original player's handbook about, you know, oaths and it's such an important thing and paladins need to follow their oath and yada, yada, yada. 
but they never tell you in the base book what happens when you break your oath. No, they put that in the DMG, a book that the DM should be getting. I still do not understand why there were subclasses in the Dungeon Master's Guide. I, I do not understand that. So, to me, Oathbreaker should be here. Uh, and the other subclasses, I will be working on those, but uh, they are not in this video just yet. In addition, you might have also noticed that there's one additional change, uh, because these subclasses grant you features at 3rd, 7th, 15th, and 18th level. Remember, I have started making a general capstone ability for all of the classes. I don't know if people are going to like it or not. But because of that, I've actually moved the capstone ability from Paladin to level 18. That's the only reason. Uh, other than that, the capstone abilities don't really change much. So if you want to use another subclass, just take the level 20 and put it at level 18. You'll be fine, right? That's literally the, the thing that you have to do. Completely fine. So that's Sacred Oath. Uh, ability score improvement, same as uh, for any class except for Ranger at this point. Um, well, no, Fighter too. Um, you get an ability score improvement in five, 5, 4, 8, 12, 16, 19, right? Extra attack. Um, I'm going to repeat it for the people that have not seen any of the other videos. Um, you still get your second attack at 5. You get a third attack at 11, fourth attack at 17. The reason for this is because cantrips always scale at 5, 11, and 17, and I got annoyed that martial classes did not get this. In addition, I also think this is going to lessen the power gap between casters and marshals at higher level. That is legitimately the only reason that that's here. Aura of Protection has not changed. Um... Pretty much at 6th level, anyone within 10 feet gets a bonus to their saving throws equal to your Charisma modifier. Minimum of plus 1. Must be conscious to grant this. It has not changed. And it still increases to 30 feet at 18th level. Blessed Armor. Um, this is something I, I picked up from somewhere I completely forgot. Uh, there was someone who, who made a, a rewrite of Paladin that was pretty interested in it. and you know what blessed armor i like this feature I, ironically enough so what is blessed armor you can bless armor you wear with an hour-long ritual that you can do during a short rest uh pretty much the funny thing is you can use a bonus action to don or doff it which is putting it on or putting it off usually remember with heavy armor you need to spend an hour put it put it on and i think like 10 minutes putting it off or something like it's long right here, you can just use a bonus action, right? So even for leather armor, if I'm not mistaken, this helps. Um, and when you doff it, you can either choose to put it with the gods, put it in some sort of a pocket dimension, but I figured you don't really want to use pocket dimension here because you're not an arcane caster. So I said you can put it with the gods, making it disappear, or drop it to the ground, and if the armor is with the gods, you can don it, stuff like that. Uh, and in addition, Blessed Armor gives you a plus one to your AC. So, you know, and it loses its blessing when you bless a new set of armor or when you die. It's just a fun little utility feature at level nine. Um, it's also when you get a proficiency bonus increase, you get, you can now use four Divine Die in one go. So I figured this was fine. Aura of the Mind, uh, starting at 10th level, any creature within your Aura of Protection becomes immune to being charmed and frightened. If it was charmed or frightened, it would enter the Aura. They are no longer charmed or frightened while in the Aura, but it does return when they go out. Um, unless they are able to get rid of it by making saves or whatever. Um, originally, this used to be an Aura against Frightened. I still find that a feature that's too limiting, and honestly, I don't even know if I like Aura of the Mind itself. <sighs> yeah, I don't know. I'm thinking of, of maybe even getting rid of this. Um, I did put it on your... All Auras pretty much are going to be put onto your Aura of Protection. That way, any size increases affect all of your Auras, and just it nicely like puts everything together into one Aura. 
Uh, but I don't know if I like this. I might. I'm. I'm thinking of changing this. I'm just not sure yet. Uh, Radiant Strikes uh, has not changed. You get an additional 1d8 Radiant Damage from melee attacks uh, starting at level 11. Uh, I think that's a good feature. It's a little boring, maybe, so I've been thinking of changing it, but you know. Aura of Immortality, this is a completely new one. Uh, starting at 13th level, your Aura of Protection's radius increases to 20 feet already, right? And then it becomes 30 at level 18. And in addition, whenever a character within the aura falls to zero hit points, you can use your reaction to heal that character by an amount of hit points equal to your charisma modifier. So pretty much they don't drop to zero. You can only do this once per long rest. Um, this is once again putting Paladin a little bit more in that utility category that we talked about. I think this is a fun feature. This also was a place where, you know, originally Paladins, I don't think, got anything at 13 because they got a new spell slot. Um, so I thought, you know, a one-time, like, you don't drop dead, I think that's kind of cool. Uh, it's something that I think you'd want on sort of more of a support slash tanky character. Uh, and then, Cleansing Touch. Beginning at 14th level, you can use your action to end one spell on yourself or one willing creature that you touch. You can use this a number of times equals your Charisma modifier. Regain expended uses on a long rest. I think this was in the original Paladin as well. I don't, know if, I don't remember if it was at 14th. Um, but I think this was pretty much there. And then Divine Champion. Uh, your Charisma and score and maximum increase by 4. And choose one other stat. Uh, and increase its score and maximum by four. So for those of you who have not seen the previous videos, um, this is pretty much what I'm doing as a capstone ability to all of the classes. They get a plus four to a specific stats, depending on their class, and then they get a plus four to another one. For people wondering why is it not strength, one of the changes I've also thought about for Paladin is to get rid of the strength multiclassing requirement because I like Dex Paladins as well. And second of all, because of that, I want you to be able to pick whether or not you want to go for a Strength Paladin, a Dex Paladin, or maybe you just want to increase their constitution. That's also a possibility to give them more hit points. If you want to increase their wisdom, that's fine with me too. Intelligence might be a bit weird. Do whatever you want, I don't care. I'm not your mom. Uh, so that's it for the general Paladin features. This is really the biggest part of the video. Um, I'm gonna be perfectly honest. However, I do want to talk about it a little bit, the two subclasses. Now, for people who uh, maybe aren't as interested in this, I'm immediately gonna say this, there are very little changes in the subclasses. At this current point in time, I have not felt a need to really change Oath of Vengeance and Oathbreaker that much. There are some changes in here, but really not that many. Um, just so you don't expect like giant changes. I've not looked at the tenets at any way, shape, or form. I'm probably going to keep those exactly the same. Um, but yeah. So, first of all, um, what did I change, right? So, let's start with Vengeance. Oath spells are gone. You do not have spell slots anymore. Ergo, you do not have access to spells anymore. That's the reason that this is gone. You do, however, still have the two additional options for Channel Divinity. And those have not changed. You still have Abjure Enemy, uh, and you still have Vow of Enmity. If I'm not mistaken, they are exactly the same as they were in the original Player's Handbook. So, you know, not that big of a deal. Uh, however, I did add a small third level feature in addition because you are losing out on oath spells. Um, pretty much what you also get is targeted defense. Whenever you take this oath at third level, you can remove a target's defenses. As a bonus action, target a creature within 30 feet of you must make a charisma saving throw or their AC decreases by one. Uh, I don't want to make these third level features very big. I want to be like I want them to be like small buffs, I guess that you can kind of get to kind of replace the oath spells, which if you think about it oath spells weren't that big of a deal. They were a big deal. Like I think you could get like hunter's mark on a paladin, which that's pretty good. 
but in my personal opinion i you know you don't want to put like a giant feature here you want to put something here that's a little small so i figured targeted defense seems fine for me other than that relentless avenger soul of vengeance and avenging angel are exactly the same as they were in the player's handbook i have not touched this i don't think i have to at this current point in time i might look at the one dnd changes and maybe make some additional changes depending on that but at this current point in time i honestly think oath of vengeance is fine as it is uh personally except of course avenging angel is now at 18th level but i already mentioned that um the same can be said for Oathbreaker. So Oathbreaker, of course, doesn't have any tenets because that's the point. You broke your tenets. Um, channel Divinity. Your Channel Divinity features are still exactly the same. That was weird. Pretty much this has not changed. You get two additional options for your Channel Divinity. Not really very big. Uh, you can control Undead and Dreadful Aspect. However, once again, a small third level increase undead core in addition starting at third level push the breaking of your oath onto others as a bonus action target a creature within 30 feet they must make a charisma saving throw against your divine dice save dc if it fails to save the creature is treated as an undead until the end of their next turn stopping it from getting healed um two things one you might have also noticed that divine smite doesn't get the additional damage die against undeads and fiends anymore uh this is one of the reasons for that second of all um this is pretty much just the thing of they can't get healed anymore and they are treated as undead which does mean that technically you can do this as a bonus action and then try to use control undead uh however the idea and maybe i should talk about this uh the idea is at that point you can only do that for one turn because the moment they stop being undead control undead doesn't work on them anymore but you can take um you know you can force the target to make you know you pretty much get like a sort of one turn command slash suggestion uh spell unless they keep failing their uh undead core save you keep using your bonus action to keep to keep them undead but they'd be making the save every single turn um so this is pretty much because one of the problems that i had with oathbreaker is that some of its feature feel very limited because you know like dreadful aspect is cool but control undead literally only works if you're fighting undead and i figured you know what maybe let's give them something that allows them to still use that undead controlling and stuff same thing with aura of hate um you, as well as any fiends and undead in your aura protection, gain a bonus to we melee weapon damage rolls equal to your charisma modifier. One of the fun things here is technically, uh, if you don't want to use the control undead part and your opponent doesn't necessarily have any healers, one of the cool things that you can do is you can transform one of your friends into a uh, undead and then they get a bonus to their attack rolls based on aura of hate. You know, you turn your Barbarian into an Undead. Uh, at level 7, they have two attacks. They make both of those attacks. Get a bonus to their damage equal to your Charisma modifier. Hey, it's a little bit of additional damage. And of course, do remember, if I'm not mistaken, uh, I don't know if it says this in the original 5e rules, but I am planning on adding that myself as well. Um, you are able to willingly fail a save. So if you want to fail this Charisma saving throw and become an Undead to deal more damage, completely fine. Uh, you do have to trust your paladin to not control undead at that point, but you know. Uh, and then other than that, uh, but other than that, Aura of Hate has not changed. Supernatural Resistance. Supernatural Resistance has changed. Uh, it has become resistance to bludgeoning, piercing, and slashing damage. Just in general, it used to be uh, from non-magical sources, which... I, I don't even think that's worth a feature at that point, because what the hell doesn't have magical weapons at level 15 exactly like minions i mean i don't think minions are a threat anyway so you know now at least this is playable uh and then dreadlord again has not changed uh except for the fact that it is now at level 18 rather than 20. 
So that is the full extent of my reworked Paladin. Um, hope you guys enjoyed. I'm already working on the Rogue, uh, which is going to be the next class. So if you want to check that out, uh, you know, you know to click the subscribe button, I guess. Other than that, um, if you have any comments, things, problems, whatever, I am still working on this, still updating this. I'm planning to go through all 12 classes and start reworking some stuff that I think is necessary. Uh, I also need to start testing some stuff. So by all means, any and all comments are very much welcome. And other than that, I am going to end this video here. So hope you guys enjoyed and I will see you all next time.